Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Happy Even After podcast. I am here today with Nina Bleicher. Nina is the host of her own podcast called On the Upside, where she talks about living life with positivity, lightness, and optimism. She loves to talk about how to live your most meaningful life after challenge and change. <laughs> divorce. <laughs> One of the biggest life turning points in her life came actually after her own divorce. So we're going to talk about all of the things today, divorce related and overcoming challenge. So welcome, Nina. How are you? Thanks, Renee. It's so fun to be here. I'm excited yeah. to have this conversation with you. I feel like we've kind of connected forever ago on social media. So this is a long overdue chat. Absolutely. I know. I think we've been kind of in that same space of divorce yeah. support and positivity and everything. And Absolutely. yeah, we've seen each other for sure. So let's start with your own divorce story. Do you mind sharing just how it, without sharing all of the details, but um, was it something that you wanted? Was it something you found yourself in unexpected? Do you mind just talking a little bit about how you came into this space from a personal level? Yeah, of course. So I was married for almost 20 years and we had, uh, we have three kids who are now 19, 16 and 13. So kind of teenager, three teenagers mm -hmm. in the house, which is quite a challenge, mm -hmm. uh, but good. It's fun. And they're, they're doing great. So I, my divorce was finalized a little bit, uh, probably about a year and a half ago or so. And uh, as I mentioned, we were married for about 20 years and had a lot of ups and downs in our marriage. We, my ex-husband had kind of more unconventional jobs, which ended up in us moving quite a bit. And we just had some things happen that uh, it really came to light at some point in our marriage that we were just really not on the same page with some fundamental ways of that we wanted to live. And although I think we had a lot of positives in our marriage, that there were just some obstacles that were insurmountable. And there were kind of some deal breakers for me that that I just really wanted to have more stability in my life and was kind of a realization that I didn't have to live in a way that wasn't true to me and feeling comfortable to me. So it wasn't, you know, a, a big negative blowout or anything like that, but just kind of a realization that we were on a different page in some really fundamental ways. So although divorce is never something that you think is going to happen or you want to happen, and of course I took it very seriously. I mean, it's not something that you you ever really plan for, I ever really plan for. I mean, I thought I was going to be with, with, you know, this was going to be our family for life when we were going to grow old together. But I think ultimately it was the best decision for both of us. I think we both realized that we just have some different ways of living that we believe in that are true to us and that we're probably better people separated than we are together. So it was quite a process. I mean, it was kind of, as I describe it, like a total teardown reconstruction of my entire life in many, many different ways. So I went back to work full time. I had been working in a family business and so was had been pretty much working our entire marriage, but was really put into a position where my my whole life changed. My company was sold right around the time of our separation. So mm -hmm. that was another real challenge where I was in kind of a really vulnerable place and our company was acquired. And I went from working kind of on a part time level to really working full time, supporting my kids on my own, and just a, a lot of really big change. So, you know, what happened for me was really taking a, a hard, honest look at where my life was and where I wanted to be and how I kind of contributed to where I was. You know, it's very easy in divorce, I think, to 
to say, oh, it was their fault. It was, you know, they cheated or they did this or that or whatever the case is. But really, ultimately, there are, there are so many things that lead up to, you know, a marriage ending. So I had to really look at, you know, how did my life get here? What what were the things that I could control and change? And then more importantly, where did I want to go from here? Who did I want to be in my life? What were my core values? What, uh, how did I want to be in a relationship? How did I want to be a parent? You know, how, how did I want to just approach life? How did I want to feel on a daily basis? And for me, getting divorced was a real personal awakening, kind of totally separate from the actual divorce and ending of the relationship side. It was like a, a cracking open of who I was and what just a lot of old stories, a lot of um, rewriting stories, a lot of, you know, careful consideration of just everything inside of me and who I wanted to be and how I wanted to contribute to the world in my life. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's kind of a general overview of what the story was, but it was, it was a big change. And although it was super painful and super difficult and I wouldn't wish it on anybody, I would not change a thing. I mean, yeah. I am totally transformed from that time and, yeah. and, and, I've done so much work and reflecting on where I want to go from here that, you know, and it's, it's usually only through those really, really hard, painful moments that we can find that portal to that, you know, real transformation that we want. I love that you said that because I think that from those hardest moments, we have so much growth and I completely mirror your sentiments there. And if it was not for those horrible moments, months, even year or so after my divorce, like I would not be sitting here today doing the work that I do. I was always a divorce yeah. lawyer, but it wasn't like it, it forced me to get really, really uncomfortable and like push myself, push the edges to see, okay, what are you capable of? And there's so much growth in that. Like we get so comfortable in our lives. And when we stop being so comfortable and get a little uncomfortable to see what we're made of and what we're capable of is, I think that's where the magic happens. So my question for you is, because as you told your story, something came to mind. Um, I have a lot of women who will come to me and say, well, my marriage isn't terrible but it's just not, I'm not happy. I'm not fulfilled, but it's not terrible. So I shouldn't leave because I'm I just, I'm not happy. Like, how did you reconcile that in your own um, head that you were, you were walking away from something that wasn't like, you know, it wasn't abusive. It wasn't horrible, but it just wasn't a good fit anymore. Like what kind of conversations did you have with yourself about that? Well, for me, there was definitely a moment of truth where there were some things that happened that were apparent to me that my ex-husband and I were just on different wavelengths. And it was thing, they were things that I didn't, you know, our marriage over time, I think, was a little bit of a gradual allowing of, of me kind of feeling like I gave up, it's hard to explain, but like little parts of myself where, Mm -hmm. where I was conceding things that were important to me, but they were little things. And then over time, it became this place where I realized these are really fundamental core values that I'm saying these things are okay, but they're really not. And it was really all these little okays over time Mm -hmm. that got me to this place where I finally looked around and realized, oh my gosh, you know, this is not who I am. This is not who I want to be. This is not who, how I want to live my life. And it was a lot of different things. It was things from, you know, what I was doing in my career to the way we were living. I mean, we were, we moved a lot and we moved a lot for his career. 
And I just think I, I felt like there wasn't balance in our relationship. So for me, it was definitely a feeling of there's no other option. You know, there wasn't really a way to work this out. And it was pretty clear, but I know for some people it's, it's not that clear. And I think you have to really ask some questions. One of, one of the most powerful questions that I like to consider is, would I want this relationship for my daughter or my son? Mm-hmm. And that's where you really start going, I'm modeling what a healthy relationship is for my kids. Does this, is this what I would want for them? Is this what I want them to learn? And, you know, of course, relationships and marriage are work. You know, it's not, it's not ever going to be, you know, that beautiful beginning of, of excitement and, and everything that happens in the beginning of a relationship. That's what a long-term relationship is, is it's compromising and, and figuring things out and overcoming obstacles and seeing who that person is when things get difficult but I think there are some fundamental things that need to be there. And some of those things are, you know, really hoping and wishing the best for your partner. And I think also you make each other better, you know, when you lift each other up. And I I feel like I have that with a lot of my girl friendships that we, we want everything good. I just spent time with my friend, Carrie, who's also been, a podcast guest and a, and a guest blogger for me. And when we're together, we're better and we inspire each other and we lift each other up and we have great ideas. And we, if we're struggling with something, we don't judge and we don't try to tell each other what to do. And I think a a marriage or a long-term relationship with, with a partner should look kind of the same where, you accept each other for who you are. You don't try to change each other and you make each other better and you want what's best for each other. And you like doing loving things for each other, even things that maybe you don't want to do. Like, I don't know, taking out the trash or something. You do it because you love your partner and you want to make them feel good. So I think, you know, when you have those things, you know it. And when you don't, you know, you start wondering, is, is this, is there balance here? Is this healthy? Is this making me a better person? And if it's not, then maybe you need to do a little bit more digging. It doesn't mean it can't work. It doesn't mean you can't Mm -hmm. go to therapy or, you know, find some guidance or work things out. I, I wish one thing I wish I would have done in my marriage is communicated my needs more. I mean, I I think often in marriages, there's a miscommunication Mm -hmm. and that book, the four love languages or it's four or five love languages. I love that book because I think that miscommunication happens a lot of the time where someone will, you know, love cooking for someone and that person appreciates that. And that's great, but really what they want is affection and they want yeah. you to hug them and you're just not that person that gives that. So communicating that and being able to figure out, I don't love hugging, but I love her so much. I want to give her what makes her feel good. And I think in tr- real loving relationships, that's what happens is you are willing to do those uncomfortable things yeah. because you care about that person. You want to give them what they need. So yeah, yeah. for me, I mean, I think it was really realizing that maybe we didn't have some of those things in our marriage anymore. Yeah, I think that's a huge one. And I think that that is a common theme with miscommunication or ignoring the other person's needs. Um, Mm -hmm. I see it all the time in clients. I see it as when people come in and sit down with me and I say, okay, what's going on? That's kind of one of the things that they'll say in sort of a roundabout way. Some people are direct and some people are indirect about it. But I think that that's really the root of where you start to see problem is because of that. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting to figure out who you are and what you need so that when you go into that next relationship, um, you're able to communicate that and able to identify it. Um, and I think that, 
you know, I think it's such an important tool. So um, there's definitely like, you don't just slam the door shut on that relationship and that marriage, like you take some lessons from it and use it moving forward. So um, yeah, well, I was seeing someone after my marriage, and he asked me, how do you want to be loved? And I, mm-hmm. I just was like, what are you talking about? I mean, yeah. I didn't, I never thought about that. I didn't even know yeah. what he meant, to be honest. But I think that's a, a question that, you know, in, in true balanced relationships, people want to know who you really are, what your needs are, and where you're coming from. They don't want you to just say, oh, I'm okay, whatever is fine. And that's who I was. I was a people pleaser. And I didn't, I didn't know how to receive. I didn't Mm -hmm. know how to have balance. But when you don't have that, you can't, you know, you need to allow the other person to give too. It's not only my right to just give, give, give. And that's actually kind of a control behavior. I didn't really know that until Mm -hmm. getting divorced that, that was my way of, of controlling the relationship is, is I wanted to always be the, the people pleaser, the giver, the compliant one, and you lose balance. You lose, you don't get respect because you're just giving all the time. You know, you have no value because you always show up. So that part, the other partner can do and be whatever they want. And it doesn't matter. They kind of take you for granted but also they don't get the opportunity to give to you, which I think yeah. I've learned is, is part of a reciprocal balanced relationship. Yeah. And it feels good to be given to and to be taken yeah. care of and to, to have someone care about you. I just didn't know how to do it, you know, yeah. and I didn't know how to communicate it. I think that's the other thing is, mm-hmm. and it goes into what you were mentioning, which is getting uncomfortable, learning how to say you know, I really would appreciate it if you would, you know, hold my hand once in a while, or if you would sit next to me on the sofa and not all the way over there. Like, I just want to be near you. That's important to me to have Mm -hmm. that physical contact and together time. But I just didn't know how to ask. I would just, you know, feel not good inside and feel like that person wasn't showing up when he didn't even know, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I would, um, so I was infamous for that because I would say, well, I don't want to burden anyone with what I was going through yeah. or the heaviness that I was feeling. And at one point, my current husband, before we were married, said to me, like, I want all of you. I don't want just like the, you know, the perfect version. I want the messy parts, like lean on me. And that, like, it took me a moment to be like, whoa, like, I've never had someone say that to me. So, you know, in past relationships, like people didn't want to be bothered with that messy part or the emotional part or whatever. And to have someone be like, no, 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 like, that's the only way we're going to be able to do this is if we're completely open and vulnerable and transparent with each other. So that was a real eye opening um, experience for me as well. Yeah, which takes time and takes yeah. trust. Mm-hmm. And I agree. I mean, being that vulnerable, authentic person, I think there's a part of us that is worried we won't be loved or accepted yeah. once they know yeah. who we really are, once we have flaws and all that. But yeah. if you think about it, your girlfriends or your kids mm-hmm. or even your partners that you've had, you almost love them more with their flaws because of their flaws, because that's part of what makes them, them. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. And so we have to allow our flaws to come out and be embraced and loved and appreciated too. Mm -hmm. But that's been really, really hard for me. I mean, I'm a Virgo, I'm a firstborn, I'm a perfectionist. Yes. (laughs) It's really hard to let my hair down in that way, but I'm, I'm learning little by little. Nina, how long did it take you to really heal post-divorce? How long have you been divorced now? So I've been divorced a little bit over a year and a half. It was finalized March of 2020, but we were separated for almost two years before that. So yeah, you know, I, I honestly feel that healing is kind of an ongoing process Mm -hmm. and divorce, as we know, is a form of grief. And I think yeah. grief really kind of always stays with you. You just learn better how to live with it. Yeah. And I still get 
tidal waves of mm. of grief or just all different kinds of feelings. And I I had no idea divorce would yeah. be this way. And it's probably good because I probably would just still be married if I knew how hard it would be. <laughs> right. Even though I was just like, I wouldn't change it. But right. uh, you know, I think like just a, probably a month or two ago, I remember I was on a run and I just got just this tidal wave of of compassion and almost a little sadness for this is going to sound kind of weird, but like for myself and the ending of my marriage yeah. and for the loss of the life and the partnership and, and that family that I had. And, you know, it's, you have so many intense, complicated negative emotions to deal with in the beginning. You've got resentment, anger, mm -hmm. frustration, extreme grief. And once you kind of can can allow some of those to to settle in and dissipate and work through some of those, I think you allow more of the almost it's almost like a removed from yourself compassion. Yeah. And when you do some of that personal awareness um, work and, and self-worth work, you're able to really feel for yourself a little bit, almost like you would a girlfriend or a friend or something that you, you just have more, it's really like a deep, deep compassion. Yeah. But I, you know, I think healing is, it's just a long, long process. And there's always something new coming up that I'm mm -hmm. working through or, or, and it's, it's almost like you get these level ups or new dimensions yeah. that, that come in that can surprise you in good ways. Like, oh, wow, I'm at this place where I think I might be getting to forgiveness for my, mm -hmm. for my ex-husband. Like, I think I might be, and then you, something might happen. You're like, oh, maybe not totally, you know, I mean, <laughs> ebbs and flows a little bit, but yeah. So, you know, it just takes a lot of time. I think it's very intentional. Um, you, I mean, you need to be very intentional and it's a process. I mean, it's, it's finding out where do you want to be from here? How do you want to live? How do you want to feel? I mean, I feel like, but when I was married, I lived in kind of like a half awake state. I was a mom and I loved that part. I was always working, which was fine. It was a little bit of a holding pattern jobs that I did to be a contributor, but wasn't like my calling or my passion. Mm -hmm. And post-divorce, I've become so much more alive and awake in every aspect of my life, in my relationships, in my spirituality, yeah. in my interest and willingness and intention to live happy and see the good and to choose positivity and, and to feel the really hard, difficult, sad things too. I mean, I think I was almost in neutral when I was yeah. married and in my life before then. I was just in the middle and I didn't feel anything really, really good, but I also didn't feel the really bad. And now I'd rather feel the really difficult and hard, but also I see and allow myself to feel and find the really good too, which has been, and, you know, I like them both. I think yeah. the hard feelings are where you learn about yourself. It's where yeah. you find compassion for other people. It's how you connect. It's, it's how you understand yourself better and how you can, those, those harder feelings can stop surfacing and you can finally move through them and pass them is by allowing them in. Yeah. and and trying to figure them out what would you say is the upside of your divorce really just that is my my personal aliveness i would say mm -hmm. that i just feel more present more intentional more alive more purposeful my and it, it's really changed every aspect of my life. Like I mentioned, I mean, my friendships are 
I, I'm all in and I show up in the in the best way I know how. And I, for my kids, I want to be there and be aware. And when they're talking to me to be listening and paying attention. And I think I just was kind of unneutral before. And then even my spiritual life. I mean, I, I just think I was not quite awake and connected. And now that's become a really important part of my life mm-hmm. too. So I would just say everything is brighter. I'm more appreciative. And I, I want to just experience everything better and more Mm. and deeper, whether Uh, it's good or bad. I love that. I have, um, I always talk about the, that divorce is not in the healing process is not linear and that the, I've been divorced for many years now, back since back in 2008, and there's still waves of things that will come up where I'll feel it. And it will be like April for me is like the, you know, the flowers are blooming and the weather's warming up. And I have this like nagging feeling that always like tugs at me. And it's like, why do I feel this way? Like I feel something. And I realized it was because that was the month that actually both of my divorces were filed. And so it was like, oh, okay. And then I have a place for it. And for, for years, I couldn't understand why I was feeling that way. But now it's like, oh, there it is. Like, welcome friend. I, I, I see you. And now I'm going to put it away in, in its proper place. But th- there's always things like that, I think, in certain holidays or, you know, you have those moments that you have some sadness and it's not regret because like I wouldn't change anything, but there are moments of the sadness um, of looking back. And, you know, and I think that when people ask, like, how long does it take to heal? Everyone wants like the quick fix answer. Like it takes six months. It takes a year. And I think it takes a lifetime. You know, I think it really, it's something that's part of your story and something that you're going to carry with you throughout your entire life and you're going to heal and grow from it, but it's not just a, you know, we can close the book completely and put it away and it's never, and never look at it again. Like we're going to have to continuously pull it out and flip through the pages and continuously like read it and learn from it. So. Right. Um, and we don't master yeah. healing. You don't master no. your life. I mean, it's just, yeah. we just get better at managing it and understanding mm-hmm. it, you know, and yeah. being able to look at it. So when those triggers come up, I mean, when spring comes and that trigger comes, yeah. it's never going to completely go away most likely, right. but you'll be able to recognize it and understand it and have yeah. compassion for yourself when it comes and say, okay, you know, that I need to give myself a little time mm-hmm. here. I need a little space, you know, so yeah. you, can, you can hold space for yourself. Absolutely. Okay. So Nina, let's talk about what you're doing to help other people um, through their divorce and you have some resources. And um, I imagine that your own personal story was the motivation to make this also your mission and your work now. So can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I have a website, Instagram uh, handle, and then Facebook page and podcasts that are all see the upside. So on Instagram, it's see dot the upside. The website is see the upside. Podcast is see the upside, and it's really all centered around choosing positivity over you know, when you're going through really difficult things. So originally this started as a post-divorce kind of processing and healing, but it really can apply to almost anything difficult in life because, you know, there, yes, there's a lot of divorce that goes on, but a lot of my listeners go through other difficult things, whether it's Um, grieving and death, or whether Mm -hmm. it's an illness, or even the ending of a friendship or something like that. It really is about processing and working through life's changes and challenges. And then as we were talking about, our challenges can really be our biggest opportunities for growth, for understanding, for compassion, for finding our biggest strength. So that's really um, what all of that platform is really about. So I write quite often, um, used to be every day, I don't do it quite every day now, but almost every day. And it really comes organically from my heart. Often it's something that 
I personally am working through in that moment. And it could be mm-hmm. anything from, you know, divorce related things to um, other things in my life too, like, you know, uh, my working through job situations or colleagues at work or dealing with something with my kids or my friendships or my spirituality, whatever. I talk about all those different things. So uh, that's really what that platform is. And then I also recently got my real estate license. So that's really fun. And I'm really focused on um, building and supporting a network of uh, support services for people who are looking for homes in the Arizona area and really making that more of a connected experience, less transactional. I do think your home is so crucial. And to me, post-divorce, when I identified my home, it was so important to me that it felt good, that it felt right. And I got really, really lucky that this home came up at just the perfect time. And it was perfect for me. I mean, I walked in and there were all these signs that, that showed me that this was the one and it was, it's just worked out beautifully. So I love helping women who have either been through divorce or just couples who are, who are looking for their home and their right place to be, which has been really complicated and challenging in this time in the housing market, which is, you know, a little, little crazy right now. Uh, And then a colleague of mine and I are going to be launching another podcast concept that is related to that, that's called The Real AZ, and it's going to be about all things Arizona homes and life in Arizona. So we're going to talk about, you know, our favorite restaurants and um, different neighborhoods, how to relocate and look at schools, questions to ask, how to add a smart home system into your home, all different kinds of things that are all related to living and relocating and just living your best life in Arizona. So Sedona is one of my favorite cities ever. Oh, I love it there so yeah. Much. Love it there. I'm overdue for a Sedona visit. I need to get <laughs> up there and go. Uh, I want to go find some vortexes. That's cool. Too. Yeah. So we went as a family vacation a couple of years ago and I'm dying to go back. Like I want to just do mm-hmm. a long weekend, like adults and just, just uh, kind of relive that. It's such a magical place. It's so, so beautiful. Yeah. Nina, thank you so much. Um, all of your links will be in the show notes as usual. Okay. And um, I hope everyone connects with her because she is an absolute delight and just full of light and love. So thank you. Oh, thank you. That's totally mutual. I feel the same way about you. It was so fun having this time. I appreciate it.